cracked a little crack in the fence, I see an opossum walking across the fence line, or walking at the bottom of the fence along the line of the fence. And the crows are sort of following it and looking down at it and getting super upset. And at this point, I was kind of done. I was like, oh, cool. The crows were upset. For some reason, there was a possum in the bougainvillea. And when the possum came out of the bougainvillea, the crows got really upset. The crows don't do this year round, but the crows have a nest with a baby in it right now. So they're extra sensitive. And um, I thought the story was over. But no, at breakfast, because we tell stories at the, at the, at the kitchen table, <laughs> uh, I'm telling my wife and my four-year-old daughter, Laurel, um, hey, I heard uh, crows really upset in the backyard. And um, then I saw a possum walking, you know, on the along the neighbor's yard on the other side of the fence, and the crows were, you know, following it and really upset. And naturally, my daughter, Laurel, says, I want to see the possum. She says, I've never seen a possum. I think she has when she was a baby baby, you know, really young, but she doesn't remember. Anyway, I, in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, well, this possum's gone. There's no chance we're going to see that. But also in my mind, there's this tenant I live by that, like, doesn't hurt to go look. Like, go look. It doesn't matter if it's there or not. Like, if you're curious, go look. So I'm like, all right, Laurel, let's go. And she runs out ahead of me, and she says, uh, she says I don't see it. And she's on, like, in the wrong part of the fence. And so I go outside, and I go to the other part of the fence. And I'm on my hands and knees looking under the fence and trying to look through the fence boards. And uh, I was like, Laurel, I don't see it either. And uh, in my mind, I had completely moved on at that point. I started walking away. I started fretting about the Paycheck Protection Loan. You know, I was, like, no longer thinking about anything in nature. And I'm just about to get back into the house. And my daughter, Laurel, says, I see the possum. And it's now on top of the fence between my yard and the neighbor to the side. And I run back up there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there it is, Laurel. Good job. You found the possum. It's just hanging up there in broad daylight, which I thought was weird. I was like, is this possum sick or what's going on? And one of the last things I saw, there was this, like, funny movement in its belly area. And uh, I moved on again. I was like, okay, I'm done. I got to go back to fretting about the Paycheck Protection Program. And uh, I'm just, I go back inside, I'm cleaning up dishes, and Laurel runs back into the house, and she says, Papa, Papa, the possum has babies. So I run back out there, and sure enough, the possum's like rolled over on its side a little bit, and there's three baby possums clinging to its belly, nursing. And uh, I was like, Laurel, good job. (laughs) I'm glad you pointed that out to me. After I gave up, so uh, so yeah, you know, mocking some of the most common birds, mockingbirds, crows, uh, and uh, you don't really need to have a lot of expertise. You just need to have a little bit of curiosity. You know, you just got to channel a four-year-old there for a second, <laughs> and uh, and the, you can see cool things. And the, the thing you can see most often this time of year is definitely babies. You know, baby birds, baby possums probably baby skunks, probably baby raccoons too. Like all those things are all around us right now. Like they're in all our yards. Everybody's got either a crow or a mockingbird or both right now. And most neighborhoods of anybody watching this webinar probably have raccoons, possums, and and, uh, and uh, skunks and, and probably some other cool things too if you live have any kind of edge. Where are we at, Michelle? What are we doing next? Thank you. I'm gonna, now I'm going to be a disembodied voice. Thank you for those lovely introductions. I think your uh, end of your introduction, Dan, is a perfect graceful segue into just a little bit more. So you talked about babies and things that might disturb babies and nests. I think that for a bunch of us on the call, if you start with just a few common local birds, what they're up to, who we might see, how we look for them, that would be a great beginning. Well, I think most people uh, are familiar with crows. Crows are all around. They're semi-obnoxious, um, pretty vocal, and um, like I mentioned quickly, they really uh, know a lot about what's going on. They don't ignore much, uh, especially this time of year when they have nests of their own. So um, a lot of dividends being paid right now to paying attention to crows. Mockingbirds, this is a uh, smallish bird, but of all the birds there are in the world, 
world, this is a slightly easier one to recognize. First of all, they are singing up a storm right now. Probably half the people, at least on this call, know that mockingbirds can sing other bird songs. That's why they're called mockingbirds. Um, <clears throat> and they sing a lot. They just, first thing in the morning, a lot of them are just sing, sing, sing. It just sounds like that, like incessantly. Um, and they're kind of just gray, but they have these really uh, broad white patches on their wings. This time of year, they show a lot. They show these white patches intentionally to repel other males and to attract females to their territory. So if you see a grayish bird making a ton of singing noise and um, showing these white wing patches, you got a mockingbird. And they're pretty amazing. They'll, they'll, uh, they're, they have nests now, they're feeding young now, and they'll do it three times in one summer. A lot of them will have three nests. They'll keep doing this uh, through the end of August. Um, some birds, you know, they have some babies in the early spring, and then they're done. They, they, they're moving on and doing other things. Mockingbirds are intense breeders, like really go for it in the, in the summer. And um, the other thing that's very super accessible and, and, and worthwhile right now, I think, is red-tailed hawks. Red-tailed hawks, very visible. Like, you know, look around for them and watch what they're doing because they have active nests right now, too. And you, if you look at all a little bit closely at what red-tailed hawks are doing, you know, look to see if they're carrying a prey item. A lot of red-tailed hawks right now are carrying prey items to their nests, so you can figure out. Their nests are super visible. They're usually in um, eucalyptus trees is the most common thing to find a red-tailed hawk nest in, and then you can watch the babies grow up and hang out on the side of the nest and learn to fly, and it is super fun. Kira, what do you think is a super common bird to tune into these days? Well, first, Dan, can I ask you a question based on what you were sharing about prey item? So we were up on the Gaviota Coast on a hillside. We saw two hawks hunting. They were hovering just above the grass. And I, we took them for a pair. But then they also seemed to compete. One got a prey item and it seemed like the other was trying to get it from that other crow or sorry hawk and it, of course it was really cool because as we were watching them they drop the one hawk dropped the prey item in its talon and then swooped down and picked it up mid-air um but it do you have a sense of whether that might have been a, like do hawks commonly hunt in pairs couples or uh do they were they maybe competing i think they're definitely a mated pair a lot of the raptors will toss prey back and forth uh to each other it's a little bit interesting to see them both out of the nest right now they probably have young that no longer need to be incubated i would guess there's probably chicks that that they can leave unattended for short amounts of time i don't know exactly why they do it um but hawks and falcons both and kites will all like catch things, sometimes intentionally pass prey to the to the mate, but sometimes it looks like the mate's trying to steal it away. I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, but it is almost certainly a mated pair and not rival hawks from different territories. Thank yeah, you. Well, question. and just to sort of, you were talking about paying attention to crows because crows know so much of what is going on. I definitely noticed that crows know what's going on with the hawks. Oh, yeah. Crows know everything about the activities of hawks for sure, and practically everything else. Like, little escapes crows' attention. Um, they're, really, they're really on it in the bird world in a wide way. <clears throat> While they are on crows and hawks, oh, sorry, Kira, interjecting a question for you. Kira, I noticed you talking about a hawk. It looked like a couple of people in our group had questions around, did you know what kind of hawk it was? Well, I am still learning about hawks in flight. If I, if I had heard their call, I can very easily distinguish. But, so first of all, it was large, so I assume it was either red-shouldered or red-tailed. Um, 
so I, I don't think it was one of the smaller raptors, um, or they were large, I should say, very large. I can very clearly distinguish the calls between red shoulder and red tail hawks, but when they're in flight and there's a glare and that we weren't able to see clearly where red markings may have been on these hawks. And Dan, you had asked what birds I've noticed, you know, that are everywhere. And I would definitely say finches. I feel like everywhere I go, I'm hearing finches and I'm seeing mating behavior of finches. And, um, and if you notice, I'm just saying finch, I'm not saying the actual, so fill in, please fill in if you know which finches I'm seeing, but the male has the red breast and the females are drab and the males, I, I mean, Tony and I, my husband and I have literally, thank you, Michelle, have literally seen the competitive mating behavior in action in its many glorious forms. Yeah, those are, I think, a good one to highlight. Those are definitely house finches, and they got the name house because they're super common around people. You see them in urban areas, suburban, rural. They're everywhere. These birds are everywhere. And um, the cool thing about them is they will, especially this time of year, is if you pay a little attention to them, you can totally see them taking food back to their nest right now. And they'll nest, some birds nest in places that you will just never find. It's like so deep in the brush that you just don't even want to find it because there's probably poison oak back there or whatever. But uh, house finches will nest, you know, in the eaves of your house, in any little port in the storm that they can find. They're really general in, in where they'll they'll nest, which makes them accessible to, to people. I've even seen them nest. It's funny, you know, they, a lot of places of business, strip malls, restaurants, stores, whatever, install these little spiky things um, in, under the eaves of the buildings to try to prevent birds from nesting. There's all these like little spikes poking up on top of street lamps too. I've even seen house fences use those things that are intended to prevent birds from hanging out use those to actually support their nest. They're small enough that they can fit down in between the, the little spikes. So just a teeny bit of a, it, it only takes like a teeny bit of slowing down, a teeny bit of curiosity to, to find a house finch nest too, I would say right now. Another bird that I have seen a ton of are the dark-eyed juncos. And I, I see them in my yard every morning, but when I go hiking, I'll see a dark-eyed junco about every 15 feet along the road to the hiking trailhead. And it made me think that, you know, that that must be sort of their radius for their nest because it's, it's literally sort of hash marked along the road. Yeah, they definitely look like that middle picture mostly around here that Michelle is showing. That one slate colored, I don't know, that's like Arizona or Washington or something. Um, that middle picture with the dark head, yeah, that's the ones that look, that's what they look like around here. Um, the cool thing about dark-eyed juncos is they're one of the few birds that nests on the ground. They're incredibly good at hiding a nest in plain view, like... You could think there could be no nest around you at all because it doesn't look like there's any possible place for there to be one. But there could just be like one inconspicuous like weed um, in one corner of your yard. And if you've just taken your hand and like brush that leaf to the side, you'll, you could discover a dark-eyed junco nest. Um, like I said, a lot of birds nest super hard to find because they're high up or impenetrably deep in the brush. But Dark Eye Junko is another one that it's on the ground. Like it's not like you can't climb up to their nest like so many birds are. You, you, if you just watch them carefully, you might see them going back to a ground nest. Well, that reminds me of another bird that spends a lot of time on the ground that I've been hearing a lot lately, which is a spotted towhee. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever found a spotted towhee nest. They're like more deep in the brush. Super cool birds. 
super cool bird, super aware of anything on the ground. If you hear a spotted toe alarming, it sounds kind of like a scrub jay. It's like, you know, I don't know. If a scrub jay is like, spotted toe is like a little slower, like, and um, if you hear that, it's probably about you. Spotted toes are quick to alarm for people on the ground, alarm for dogs, alarm for cats. Um, but sometimes you catch them alarming about something uh, less common and more exciting too, like bobcats, gray fox, uh, anything. Could be any any animal on the ground this time of year, spotted toe you could alarm for. Super hard to find their nest, but but a good bird to, to listen to. Can you do just a little more back to our friends, the mockingbirds and crows um, for, just because as you pointed out, Dan, those do seem like probably regular neighbors for everyone here. Say a little more about mockingbirds and crows. Please. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, okay. This is what I'm gonna say about mockingbirds. Uh, they like to nest in uh, hedges or things that are hedge-like and also pretty wide in what they'll nest in, like all kinds of things as long as, there's, as long as they're dense. But it's not too high up. It's usually just as high as your eye level or not, not too much higher than that and sometimes a little bit lower, but also kind of uh, on the more accessible side to humans to, to locate a nest. The other thing that is uh, exceptional about them, I would say, is mockingbird chicks are perhaps the loudest local chick. You know, some birds that are being born right now and begging for food in the nest, they beg like this. You can just barely hear them, even if you're paying attention. Mockingbird chicks are like, it is strangely loud. Like, I don't know how they get away with that. I don't know how they're not all discovered by crows and other hawks and eaten up. Uh, maybe it's because the mockingbirds like fiercely defends them, but, um, but you can hear them easily. They're very plaintive. They're loud and they're hoarse and whiny. And there's tons of them out there right now. I heard them on my bike ride home in a big rose bush. It was on the other side of somebody else's fence. I couldn't go in to investigate or, or find it, but but mockingbirds are definitely out there. Um, if anybody finds a mockingbird nest, the first two people that submit uh, some kind of claim that they found a mockingbird nest, I will personally donate fifty dollars to the charity of your choosing. That's how accessible oh. they are, and that's how much <laughs> I think you could get out there. And uh, and find them, and then it's pretty exciting because then you can just watch mockingbirds take food to the nest uh, all day long, and you can see the birds grow up, and it's super fun. And since you just mentioned people finding things like nests and mockingbird nests, a couple of questions are rolling in. Um, I know I ask you to talk more about crows, but this is a quick tangent for both of you. What is different? As you can imagine, there are a number of questions about what is different today. Are the birds behaving differently because the rest of us, most of us are sheltering in place? Are there different birds who are here? And I'm gonna add three questions in one. Are there, if we see birds doing things we're not used to, should we worry about birds? Like, do they need us? Do they need our help? Because of COVID-19, I don't think too terribly much. Um, I think the biggest change is more people are outside. So I think more people are noticing birds than they ever have before. I'm sure birds are doing a little bit different, but probably not as much different as we are. <laughs> the bigger change I think is actually us and uh, our habits and what we're paying attention to and uh, probably less so in the birds. We totally have to worry about birds. You know, before all this uh, coronavirus, uh, descended upon us. Audubon and the Cornell Lab of Birds last year released a study that some absurd percentage of birds in the last hundred years have disappeared. I forget the number, but it's absurd. If you heard the number, you'd be like, oh my God, it's like the birds are disappearing. It's in the billions of birds. There's billions less birds than there, there were a hundred years ago. So, so we definitely have to worry about birds. I wouldn't worry about them 
too much related to coronavirus, but um, I would worry about them more with respect to their habitat. Since we're talking about breeding, I'll just make one quick plug too. If you want to take, if you want to add one more layer to your enjoyment of birds, like one is just like seeing what they do, and that's awesome. Since we're getting into conservation a little bit, us probably the most helpful thing you could, the average person, citizen science kind of thing a person could do, is uh, when they see a breeding record or evidence of birds breeding, bird breeding. There is a Santa Barbara County bird breeding. Uh, database. Um, it's hosted by Audubon. You can go to Santa Barbara Audubon and then you look for Breeding Bird, Breeding Bird Atlas, Breeding Bird is, you'll find it. And uh, then you can just like submit your, your observation. That, those observations are directly used for local conservation. They're used for policy, for advocating for policies. They're used for preserving uh, open spaces. Like that is the number one, in my mind, one of the number one local things, one of the best things you can do locally to to be a ally of the birds. Thank you. That is, uh, I'm going to look for an ungraceful segue here, just so we keep coming back to some, um, it was a far ranging. Yep, topic. that's it. Yeah. SBC Breeding Bird Survey, that green box there. Right. On the right. <laughs> Kira, I wonder if you could talk for a study. second about how you learned the term bird language in a way that someone else who hears that term and doesn't know what you're talking about might begin to understand. Sure. Well, I believe the first time I heard the term bird language was at an Art of Mentoring workshop with John Young. John Young, who is a mentor and storyteller and master of bird language, a tracker. And we participated in that workshop in a, in a sit, a bird sit. And we positioned various people across the landscape for 20 minutes we, the people were silent. We were tuned in to what was happening with the birds. And then afterwards, we gathered and pieced together from our observations and our experiences what the birds know, essentially, and what the birds were communicating about what was going on. And often it has to do with either but the idea with the bird sit was for the humans to sit long enough to where the birds stop sort of alarming and stop adjusting their behavior because you're there. And they, they may still, I mean, that's part of it, but um, trying to really tune in to what they're doing separate of the humans. And a lot of times it has to do with a potential predator, the birds might be alarming because of what they see or they're gathering nest material or they're c communicating to each other either within their families or across families, across species. And that experience was different from what I grew up with. My dad was an avid birder. He was a strong participant in Audubon and my understanding of his sort of what I call traditional birding was that you had to have binoculars around your neck and you had to know what you know the difference between birds based on how they looked and my dad wasn't as good as identifying birds by how they sounded and then there are so many other pieces to it in terms of bird behavior so th for me, this rounded out the experience of connecting and tuning in to nature and in particular, the life around us and the interdependency of life around us and noticing, developing a practice of tuning in to where I was able to recognize patterns and habits of the life around us. And what's amazing is 
to speaking to what Dan was talking about, I feel like right now with sheltering in place, I have an awareness that I haven't had in years past. And my first response is, wow, this year there's a lot going on with the birds. <laughs> the birds are really busy. But the reality is there that's always the case, especially this time of year with nesting. But it's my tuning in that has increased and my attention. And the one last thing I'll say about bird language is that it's very accessible. I, I, it's something that I can practice for as little or as long as I have available. And with, during when we're not sheltering in place and I'm sort of rushing off to the car, I can take the 30 seconds it takes for me to walk to my driveway and tune in to what's going on with the birds. And it's also, it seemingly, you know, it's, it's a vast world. And so it's seemingly endless in terms of what I can pay attention to and learn about and recognize locally and then connect that into a broader context of what's going on globally, like Dan was talking about in terms of how many birds we've lost. Since you used the word learn, I'm definitely seeing a number of questions around for those of us who aren't as quick at tuning into the birds in those 30 seconds or don't necessarily recognize the bird that we see as we're walking from the house to the car. Can you both just share sort of lightning round style a few quick ideas about how to get started if I'm someone who wants to learn to begin recognizing the birds around me? Yeah, I could try to lead off there. It's real. It's it can be super overwhelming because there's just this incredibly huge, diverse, constant, dynamic world of birds, and it's, and it can be perplexing to figure out how to step into such a huge thing. Um, but on the other hand, it's actually the best thing to do is actually the easiest thing to do, and the easiest thing to do is to pause you know even now even with shelter in place even if you're not working it's still super busy i mean there's still a gazillion things to do especially if you got kids at home um your life has not slowed down much at all if you've got kids at home <laughs> even if you're not working um but if you find a little moment where you can pause outside if you're outside and you can just pause and see what you notice around you. If you see a bird, focus on that bird for just a couple of minutes. Don't worry terribly about uh, what the name of that bird is. The, the name of that bird is a good way to, to connect with it. It's not the only way. Um, the easiest way to connect that, with that bird is to watch what it's doing. If it's in your backyard, don't worry about trying to identify it. Just say like, oh, what's that bird doing? Just watch it for a minute, just a minute. That's all you got. <laughs> That's all you got in life <laughs> is, is a minute at a time anyway. Um, and then the next day or later that afternoon or the next morning or whatever, when you're outside in your backyard, just pause again. Look around. Is that same bird there? What's it doing today? Is it not there? Is there a different bird there? If you just pause and watch the birds, you will start to come into a relationship with them and know which birds are in your backyard which birds are there every day, which birds are there once in a while, what they're doing. Are they going into your garden looking for insects? Are they trying to find a little puddle of water that collected somewhere from the irrigation? Are they on a perch of a little branch looking for flies and flying out and trying to catch a fly as it flies by? If you, you know, pause for a minute twice a day, every day, you will start to learn who the birds are and what they do in your backyard. And the more you, the longer you continue watching them, the more fascinating things you will see that they do. And uh, eventually you will, you will come to learn their, their names, but it's not even the most important part. The most important part is feeling like, to me, the most important part is feeling like I have some kind of communion with the birds. As Kira mentioned, I was sort of my words, my version of the words I heard Kira say was, you know, I, I like feeling like I'm part of something bigger 
than just me and even bigger than just people. And that sense of belonging uh, is confers a lot of peace to me. Kira, how do you start? How do you start, Kira? I really appreciate what you said about pausing. And I would say that has been part of, that has been central to my practice. The other piece for me, I guess I do enjoy naming and I know that, you know, that's common. Um, and part of the naming is so that my brain can group the name and the sound and the behavior. I, you know, I remember little stories that Dan and others have taught me over the years, like for instance, about acorn woodpeckers, that they live in family groups and a lot of their vocalizations are chattering within their families. And so I like to listen for the different types of communication that I then associate with specific birds. And one of the things that has helped me in my practice is to be able to know about, let's start with a number five or, you know, 10 birds that I get to know really well. And then from, you know, how they look, what their typical behavior is, are they foraging on the ground or are they usually up in the trees? And then, um, and what their typical calls are. And then when I hear something that's not within my, you know, comfort zone, that I, I like to follow that thread. And so, you know, a bird or a, a sound or a set of behaviors that is just outside, you know, on my edge really excites me. And, I, you know, I know for a long time, there was a call that I thought really, was it sounded like a wren tip but there was something different in it and i couldn't quite put my finger on it and it took a really long time before i really identified just with my ears because i wasn't ever seeing this bird what it was about this bird's call that was different from a wren tit and i was able to articulate that to dan and um I said, it, it sounds like a piano key, but in the rhythm of a rent it. And he said, oh, well, I'm guessing that is a Nuttall's woodpecker. And then it was just like, whoosh, everything came together. So just having those edge sort of challenges is exciting and it just propels my learning and my ability to tune in to more sounds. Speaking of tuning into sounds, I'm seeing some questions about seasonality. Are there birds that are here now that aren't here at other times? And I'm also hearing some questions about what are the birds up to when it looks to us like they're fighting? How about mm. leading off those two, Dan? <laughs> um, yeah, we're just the, there are birds that are here only in the winter. There's some birds that are here only in the summer, and there's some birds that are here year-round. And we're just about past the time for winter birds. The birds that are only here in the winter are mostly all gone. There's only probably one really reliable uh, winter visitor still around, and that's the cedar waxwing. The other birds that are only here in the winter have, have mostly all gone. You might you might catch a really late white-crowned sparrow. Um, still this week but but maybe not um and then there's birds that uh yeah of the birds that are all here only in the summer i think one of the more uh noticeable birds that's summer only is the uh, orioles mostly hooded orioles and some bu bullocks orioles too on the coast um they're pretty flashy they love uh palm trees the, the washingtonias they they so many so many hooded orioles yeah that's the hooded oriole there so many hooded orioles uh uh love to put their nests in the washingtonia washingtonia uh palm trees so if you got palm trees anywhere near your house be on the lookout for orioles they're only summer they're only here in the summer um you know other birds the crows are here year round the mockingbirds are here year round red-tailed hawks and red-shoulder hawks are here year year round um, 
A lot of birds are fighting now. Um, birds can fight all year long. Um, you, I'm curious if anybody listening sees birds of different species fighting. That's much more rare. When you see birds of the, that look the same as each other and they're fighting, that's usually over a, a territory and or a mate if those two are even separable in a bird's life. If, if, a, if a bird has a territory and a mate, then um, it could be fighting over both of them at the same time. Um, birds are definitely trying to take other birds' territories and and uh, sneak in to visit another bird's mate. Like that happens kind of constantly, uh, for sure daily. Um, and birds don't like it when other birds invade their territory. So a lot of the fighting right now among birds is territorial. Um, uh, the fighting, the, the actual fighting that you see, the physical interaction between birds is the last step of it. The first stage and the biggest stage of most birds fighting is flying to the edge of your territory and singing a song, which I think is super cute. <laughs> that that uh, birds' main effort of defense is singing. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just think that's awesome. It's only, uh, it's kind of a last straw when a birds, when two birds get into a, a physical brawl. That means that the singing at the edge of the territory didn't work. Dan, I had a question about hummingbirds. It seems that there are times of the year that I'm much more aware of hummingbirds action and I know that they are very territorial, but are, are they migratory? The honest hummingbird is here year round. Um, there's a the the next most common hummingbird is Allen's hummingbird. There are some here year round. They drop down in numbers in the in the winter, and then their numbers increase in the summer. And then the other you can see several other ones on the on the coast side. You can see more on the the San Ynez Valley side. But the other common one I would say on the coast side, the coastal side of the mountains, is a uh, the rufous hummingbird, which is really just in migration. You might catch a few uh, breeding here in the summer, but you see a lot more in, in migration. Um, the, the interesting thing, the slightly uh, niche thing about hummingbirds and fighting is, uh, I mentioned most birds are defending a, a territory and uh, a mate. A lot of uh, male hummingbirds are very defensive of a food source. You know, one of the amazing things about Santa Barbara is there's flowering plants year round. If you're a bird that focuses on nectar, you like Santa Barbara. <laughs> Santa Barbara is the place to be because there are so many flowers all year long. So, so some examples, there's this tree, local street tree in town called a bottle brush. Uh, the flowers look like red, red uh, bottle brushes. Hummingbirds love those. They they flower year round and male hummingbirds will just say will just adopt a tree and say this is my bottle brush tree anybody else that comes around is going to have to answer to me um then they'll even defend it you know outside the breeding season the other thing i'd say about mockingbirds is they're still breeding now and they have a wide breeding season in santa barbara they're one of the earliest birds you can catch breeding uh They'll, you could find a hummingbird nests are recorded in as early as December um, because we have flowering, uh, a, a profusion of flowering and plants as early as December in Santa Barbara. Mm. Are you ready for a few specific bird questions? Anybody? Yeah, yes, excellent. Do any songbirds communally raise their young? That is a good question. It depends what you mean by songbird. Songbird is not a uh, ornithological term. Um, the birds, there's lots of birds actually that communally raise their young. Um, it's, it's it's debatable whether or not you call them a songbird or not. Um, cliff swallows have huge colonial nests. I'm not so sure how much they actually cooperate with each other's 
young, but they nest colonially. Of course, there's uh, rookeries, like at Goleta Beach, there's a great blue heron rookery, and there's some night heron rookeries down by the, the waterfront. Um, probably the most communal bird that uh, is, is also kind of just has a charismatic story is the, the acorn woodpecker. Uh, they definitely get a, you know, find a place where there's lots of acorns, find a tree where they can store those acorns, and then they'll have multi-generational families that occupy that territory and use that, that larder, and actually do regularly, you know, more than just the two, the mother and the father will feed the young, the other extended family members will, will feed the young. Um, there's other birds that do that too, a little, there's, you know, everything happens in nature, and every bird tries something once or twice or every so often. Um, there's lots of examples of other birds with little bits of communal behavior here and there, but, but probably the star there is, uh, is the acorn woodpecker for communal nesting. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to do, this is going to be another lightning round, so we can get a few of our guests' specific personal bird mysteries in. So here are a few. I'm going to go one at a time and you can give a quick answer. How about that? If you see what looks like a pair of nesting birds in your neighborhood, in this case, ducks, and they look to you familiar, like maybe it's the same pair that were in the same place last year, could it be that they are the same pair? <laughs> That's a great question. If you're Recording it scientifically, you usually don't assume that unless you've banded them, but that happens a lot. A lot of birds use the same territory over and over again if they survive. So there's a good chance that they're the, that they're the same pair, but it's hard to prove it unless you ban them. Next, lightning. At Pinnacles, two birds flying in and out of a hole in a tree, presumably feeding babies. They look like starlings. I'm surprised. Is it common for starlings to nest in tree holes? Yes. Carve, uh, starlings are cavity nesters. They don't build cups of, they don't build nest cups made out of twigs. They almost, I think they're obligate cavity nesters is the ornithological term. And they use a wide variety of cavities. You'll see them in holes in light poles, holes in houses, holes in uh, anywhere you might see any kind of cavity in a tree or otherwise a starling might nest there. Next question is about the parrots of Montecito, not the parrots of Telegraph Hill, but the parrots of Montecito. Did they get freed in a fire? Are they reproducing in the wild? How many are there? You know anything, Kira? I, I mean, I heard the rumor that they were freed in the Painted Cave fire, and I, I have seen them, I mean, for sure every week. They, I mean, during certain times of the year, I probably see them every day. And they've definitely increased in number, and I assumed that they they reproduced, but I don't know if they just recruited. Okay, question going all the way back, hearkening back to Dan's intro story. Why were the crows so upset about the possum? That is, I have the same question. It seems like the crows should have not devoted that much energy to me to to this possum like there's no there i know where this these crows nests are they're high up in a palm tree there's no way this possum was going to go up the palm tree to attack the crow's nest or harm the crows in any way that i could possibly imagine um but that's just kind of how crows are you know like crows are just they just they're so successful they seem to have energy to burn um they can harass hawks endlessly year round. Um, so I, I don't think that the crows needed to do that, but at the same time, crows have been around longer than humans, like millions of years crows have been around. Like the crow I saw in my backyard is the descendant of an impossibly long lineage of crows. So whatever it's doing must, I have to surrender to the reality that whatever that crow's doing, it must have served them well for millions of years to, to lose their cool over a possum. <laughs> Kira, do you want to answer the question, what is your favorite bird? My favorite bird. Okay, if I am forced to choose one, I think 
it would be really hard to choose between a barn owl and a great horned owl. Um, but if I had to, I think I would choose the barn owl. And I regularly, just in my neighborhood, which is, you know, pretty populated, I regularly hear great horned owls, barned owl, barn owls, and screech owls calling to each other. And I have heard juveniles as well. So they are definitely uh, mating and reproducing and just in neighborhoods, which is another exciting part about backyard birding. I'm so glad you brought up the owls. Someone earlier said, could you please mention the owls? So thank you, Kira. Before we go, five minutes left till some of our lunch hours are over. We have talked a lot about nature connection, dropping in, sense of belonging, paying attention to our surroundings. There is still a hunger out there for some of that didactic learning. So a uh, popcorn round of resources, whether online or field guides or favorite books. How have you learned what you know about the birds, including what they look like, how to identify them, their names? Uh, lightning round. I would. I, I use the Sibley's Guide to Birds. I use the the North America edition. Um, I've used iBird a tiny bit, uh, which is an app for smartphones. Um, I also use eBird, which is another citizen science tool, um, which I think is really good for uh, learning. You don't have to. There's more. You can you can submit data to it, but you can also just explore what other people are seeing. So, for example. Anybody could access it in this way, like from me down to somebody who's never paid attention to birds ever. You could see a bird in your yard, wonder, what is that possibly this kind of bird? Then you go on to eBird and search for that bird, and it'll show you all the places that everybody has recorded that bird in the whole United States. And you can zoom into your neighborhood, and you could see, they even highlight the ones that are from the last two weeks. So me or anybody else might see a bird, not know for sure what it is, go on to eBird and say, for example, uh, lark sparrow. Uh, search for lark sparrow, zoom into the place where I thought I saw it, and then see if other accomplished birds, birders have seen it in the last two weeks. And then you're like, oh, okay, that's a good, can't other people are seeing that bird around right now. It's a good chance that is the bird I saw. Or nobody's ever seen this bird in Santa Barbara County. Well, rule it off the list then, probably, for now at least. I mean, it's possible you're the only person to see that bird in the county ever, but if you're just getting into birding, unlikely. E-bird. Kira, any additions? I just have a question for Dan, if we're getting into some didactic learning. If we see a bird that we don't know who it is, what are the three physical characteristics we should pay attention to quickly before it flies away that we can then use to look it up on Google or eBird? Great question, thank you. Yeah, I would just say note where you saw it because that'll help if you find another human birder to, to bounce. If you ask another human birder, they'll say, well, where did you see it? Was it on the ground? Was it in a bush? Was it up in the tree? Was it flying? If you're close enough to see the bill, that's probably the most useful piece of information because that says so much about what a bird does in its life. And then, of course, general color features like wing bars or tail markings or just anything that strikes you is that you notice about the appearance. So what it's doing, the bill, and then anything else that stands out. Thank you. All right, 30 seconds each to say anything you really wanted to say, but you have not yet said. Kira, you first. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the only thing I was hoping to ask Dan about was I saw a bird I didn't recognize through Google search. I'm wondering if it's a black-throated gray warbler. Is, is that a bird that you've seen around our parts? We have them. It's not the most common warbler around, but we definitely have black-throated gray warblers. Thank you. Totally. You're certain, Dan. <laughs> Just thank you. Super fun. Super fun. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us talking about birds. You can find us online at wyp.org. 
you can email me, michelle at wip.org, if you have feedback, questions, comments, you think we should do more, you think we should do another topic, let me know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. We're out. <laughs>